Hey, TYT, I'm Nomi Konst. Uh, today we're going to have a conversation about gun laws in America um, post uh, the event that occurred in Alexandria, Virginia, including um, Representative Scalise, where he was shot in the hip and he's in critical condition, as well as three other uh, staffers. Of course, the Republican um, congressman was at a Republican baseball game. You know, they do these things in Congress they, to, to increase camaraderie. Uh, and it was early in the morning on Wednesday that the representative was shot by a man named Jane, James Hodgkinson. You know, we're learning more about him. He, he actually passed after being shot um, during a shootout with authorities. We're learning more about Mr. Hodgkinson because immediately it turned into a political debate over uh, his politics because he was a, a, a liberal. He supported Bernie Sanders. When he went to his Facebook page, there was a lot of anti-Trump rhetoric on the page and a lot of... Um, you know, every, uh, the whole scope of, of the liberal spectrum, not just, you know, Bernie Sanders. He posted things about Tim Kaine as recently as last month uh, and from different, you know, liberal institutions like Think Progress. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, we're very grateful to have Alex Yablon, who works um, for The Trace, and he is an expert on all things uh, related to gun laws. And, and he, he was on Twitter yesterday on Wednesday while the events were breaking and while uh, this became a real political conversation. I saw him uh, cite quite a bit of information from experts in the field about how much politics or how much their people's viewpoints actually uh, can influence whether or not they take action in these types of events. So, Alex, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's just start off with, with the big question. Can somebody's politics really affect whether or not they take action um, in an incident like this? Well, you know, it can kind of, uh, it can affect the way that they express uh, this sort of explosive anger. But, you know, I was, I looked at Hodgkinson's Facebook page, and frankly, the postings that he was making, by the standards of, you know, if you spend all day on the internet, like myself, you know, it was actually fairly mild compared to a lot of the stuff that gets thrown back and forth. Um, you know, I think that and also, so many people engage in really outrageous uh, political speech on the internet. A very, very small number of people actually take up guns. Um, so, you know, I've been writing about and reporting on these kinds of incidents for two years now. You know, our our website launched almost exactly two years ago. We were, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, we're a nonprofit reporting website. Just we cover basically the big the question of the place of guns in American life. When we launched two years ago uh, was when the, the Charleston shooting happened. We had our one year anniversary, anniversary when the Orlando shooting happened. Um, you know, and now we have a third shooting, uh, a third mass shooting. You know, all these people had that perpetrated these things often have uh, very, very strident political beliefs. But, you know, Two years ago, we had a white supremacist. A year ago, we had a guy who had some kind of interest in, in you know, jihadist uh, uh, extremism. And now we have a guy who said thing, you know, post on Facebook, things not so dissimilar from like your old hippie uncle or something. Um, but a much stronger indicator, I think, is people's conduct in their actual life. You know, actions speak a lot louder than words. In all of these cases, we have examples of, you know, for instance, in Hodgkinson's case, he was uh, arrested after a few uh, domestic violence incidents uh, involving his family, um, you know, really pretty scary stuff uh, that just indicates a kind of personal inability to regulate anger. You saw the same thing with, with Omar Mateen in Orlando. You know, there was a long history of, of him you know, abusing his his partners, uh, of of making threatening comments to coworkers, and and sometimes you know this would take on a political cast, but the really the stronger pattern was that these people um, are alienated from and alienate people around them. Will often threaten people. Uh, you know, you see this even in cases where there isn't necessarily a, a political bent to a mass shooting. Think about Virginia Tech. Right. Uh, you know, that the perpetrator of that shooting, there was no political content really to his actions beforehand, but there was a just anger coming out of his pores. You know, mm -hmm. he, he, he really unsettled people around him in a similar way to, say, 
you know, Dylan Roof, who mm -hmm. did have a very political agenda. Well, let's let's um, take a, a step back for a second because there's there's a lot to unpack here. Um, you know, we've had these mass shootings. There's one every day. We've we've seen the statistics. And in, in the case of yesterday, there were a couple, unfortunately. Uh, it, you, 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 some of them get national attention. Some of them do not. Uh, usually, it's the ones that tend to have these. You know, they're they're more shocking. They'll get more attention based on how they're conducted, um, who their audience is. But you have a couple of instances like you'll have the lone young white man, right? There's that kind of scenario where um, you know maybe they're they're having personal issues. If in a case like Columbine, it was you know being a young white man who was in high school and having all that you know all that energy around him, um, around them. And then there's you know the situations where you have a, a political like a, an ISIS related situation where. Um, ISIS, whether or not they actively recruit these members or not, they're posting propaganda online and young men traditionally are the ones who, again, they're lonely. There's always this, this era of loneliness, right? But what really shocked me about this situation uh, was he's older. He's a 66-year-old. He was a 66-year-old man and he, you know, liberal ideology, everything that Bernie Sanders said was nonviolent. So it wasn't like he was reading propaganda on the internet that was right. saying these things. Um, is loneliness sort of the common thread? Are you, is that what the experts are saying? Um, you know, certainly, uh, so, uh, cer a certain social isolation, um, you know, and, and kind of inability to, to, uh, you know, relate to other people, I think, um, you know, think about there, there, there have been some other shootings in the past year, uh, or two committed by older men, you know, think about, um, the assault on the, Colorado Springs Planned Parenthood that was perpetrated by you know a middle-aged man uh, who you know kind of lived in the woods uh, had a series of of dysfunctional uh, uh, you know romantic relationships and marriages um, you know but yeah there you know regardless of age there's a pattern of of these sort of destructive relationships and and explosive anger um, and you know the 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 political uh, at, the political rhetoric can possibly direct the feeling or, or affect you know say what kind of of target okay. you might select. But I, I think it's it's hard to say it 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 is a stronger indicator that someone is at, is at risk of committing something like this than you know their emotional life, their 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 past conduct and violent behavior. What type of legislation do you think? would be most effective in, in weeding out these types of situations? I mean, obviously we have a massive, you know, gun epidemic in this country, um, but there's, you know, again, there is different policies that affect, affect different types of shootings, whether it's, you know, just the general suicide prevention, the number one cause right. of, of gun um, deaths in, in America, or, you know, gang violence, or uh, in, like in the case of Chicago. I mean, there's different types of legislation that would affect all of these epidemics. But in this type of situation where you, you do have one mass shooting um, a day, and, and granted, they're not all these types of mass shootings, uh, what kind of legislation would prevent this this type of shooting? Well, you know, it, it, it's hard to say a little bit, uh, because despite the fact that these things come so frequently in the media, they are comparatively rare, you know, say compared to um, domestic violence incidents or suicide or sort of, you know, personal disputes, say, involving alcohol. Um, but there are some, some states have instituted some laws that attempt to deal with this. For instance, uh, California, after the uh, Isla Vista shooting, um, created something called a gun violence restraining order. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the parents of the young man who carried out that attack uh, were, you know, as in other cases, aware that their son was profoundly disturbed, that he was making threats, that he was interested in violence. Um, but he had not yet, uh, you know, it had not yet gotten to the point where he had committed a crime. That said, there was a really clear pattern of behavior that was unsettling. Um, so they went to the police and asked him, you know, can you do something? We, we were worried that our son is going to act out and is going to hurt himself or others. Wow. They didn't have a legal mechanism that they could utilize at the time. So after that, they, uh, Elliot Rogers' parents petitioned the state of California to create this program where a family member or a police officer or other figure um, 
can petition a court to temporarily uh, seize someone's guns or prevent them from buying uh, new guns. Um, and then, you know, after a, a given period of time, maybe a month or so, they can, they'll have a day in court where they can, you know, say, you know, I, I should be allowed to have my guns for X reason. I'm no longer a risk. Or, you know, maybe they don't. Um, there, and there are some other states that have instituted similar similar uh, uh, programs. Indiana, oddly enough, you know, not hardly a, a coastal blue state, um, but they have a program uh, pretty similar to this. And there was a study done of this uh, program that found that a lot of times people just simply don't show up to court to try to get their guns back. Because um, it costs but, money. I mean, they have to bring a lawyer in. But, Right, and you also have to demonstrate that you're you're no longer a threat, and perhaps people realize when it gets you know I'm I'm not exactly sure, but perhaps people realize when it gets to that point where people who know them and care about them are 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 bringing in the court system, you know that maybe they do realize they have a problem. Uh, another thing that some other states have done is, you know, there's the federal background check system, which prohibits people from buying guns based on certain criteria. You know, say if if you've committed a felony. Uh, if you've been involuntarily committed to psychiatric care, you know, if you have a documented history of drug abuse. Um, but there's been a lot of research by public health experts and, and, and psychologists, psychiatrists who pointed out that, you know, the things that are most likely to indicate future violence or, or worse violence aren't necessarily the kinds of things that the federal background check system takes into account. Uh, and so some states, like, again, California, have added their own categories um, of prohibiting qualities, uh, prohibiting factors. Uh, you know, for instance, if you've committed a, a violent misdemeanor, you know, like an assault, uh, the kind of thing that wouldn't necessarily get you sent to jail, but, you know, you, you say you hurt someone, that's, that's a pretty good indicator that you might act out violently again. So the state of California, unlike, say, Texas... Uh, will prevent you from, uh, you know, from buying a gun if you've committed some of these lesser violent crimes. Um, so that's another thing. So that, in a situation like this, you know, he had he had been arrested for domestic violence. He, if he had right. gone to California, he would have been blocked from from purchasing his gun. Do we do we know where he purchased his well, guns? By the way, um, uh, it, it's hard to say. I, I would say uh, that there is a there is a little bit of a tricky. Uh, twist to this, which is the charges against him were dropped. Ah, right. So, you know, you, there's a due process concern. You want to make sure that this person, you know, someone has gone before a judge, that, you know, may not have uh, resulted in him getting his, his guns taken and, and away. And a side uh, note, you know, all this legislation is related because there are states where, like, in New York City specifically, not New York State, um, you're not allowed to drop those uh, charges in domestic violence because there's a history of uh, spouses or, or, or partners who will drop it because there's, you know, once it settles in, they realize there's financial ties to their partner. And, and so a lot of partners will drop right. charges, um, which, of course, you know, can possibly cause more violence in, in the future. So it's, it's really interesting because that, that loops right. over into other types of legislation. Um, what legislation is out there right now, whether federally or even in some of these states, that could if it's in a different state, set the standard, something that could really be pushed on a national level and have real impact? Or is there anything happening at the federal level that can give us hope? You know, um, uh, <laughs> it's hard to say. Uh, the, the Republicans obviously have complete control of the federal government. And uh, they, you know, even the most moderate Republicans uh, are loath to do things like expand the background check system or make it more difficult to get guns um, because the NRA will really hammer them. Um, and the NRA exerts an enormous amount of power uh, in the Republican Party, you know, and they don't compromise. They don't make allowances for people, you know, say, even if you're a, a, a politically moderate uh, or comparatively moderate uh, Republican who represents a, a sort of a, a like a mid Atlantic state, right. like say uh, you know Maryland. Pat Toomey, mm -hmm. yeah, or, you know Pat Toomey in in Pennsylvania, um, you know he's a, a conservative Republican in some ways, but he sponsored background check legislation a few years ago. I'm not sure he would do that again. You know if he would go out on a limb and and offer legislation like Manchin Toomey in this moment. Um, 
So it's it's hard to see how at the federal level this would change things. Then again, being on the opposite end of a gun may adjust how Republicans think about this. I haven't seen them anyone say that. Mo Brooks, uh, a representative who was there, uh, you know, he was obviously horrified by what happened to his colleagues. But you know, he he gave a statement saying this doesn't change his position on guns. There were there was so, even some some talk about some congressmen wanting to bring gun holsters with them into the Congress. Like that's or being allowed to carry guns around. Right. Um, you know, some people pointed out that, uh, you know, they, they, this was perhaps not worse because there were uh, some armed, uh, you know, Security. Capitol Police there. Uh, you know, the Democrats pointed out that none of the people at the Democratic pros, uh, practice across town, uh, you know, were members of the leadership. Uh, so they didn't have bodyguards. So there was no one there who would have been able to fire back. Um, now, you know, that kind of is that that that, that is a, a frequent thing that, you know, the NRA will try out. You know, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Is there any evidence uh, of that? Real well, evidence? Uh, it's 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 really, you know, it, it's it's hard to say. It's not like you can have a controlled experiment for this kind right. of thing. Well, uh, I know that the FBI has come forward and said, you know, in mass shooting situations, it's it's more effective to grab objects and try to you know, uh, knock the person down, then shoot. Because, you know, even in stressful situations where you have people trained in this, it's still the percentage of actually hitting the target is very low. Yeah, no, it's very, it's a very chaotic dynamic situation. And, you know, I'm, I'm reminded here of the shooting at the uh, Umpqua Community College in Oregon last year. Uh, you know, there was a guy uh, a student on campus uh, who did have a concealed carry license and had a handgun on him uh, and while the shooting was going on. And he was quoted in an, in an interview saying, I, I wasn't going to go out there and try to take this guy down and be a hero because I knew that police were going to show up soon. They were going to be looking out for someone with a gun. Right. And they may have thought that, you know, this good guy with a gun was the perpetrator. Um these are very, very complicated, chaotic situations that, you know, it's really hard. You know, I, it's not like the the uh, police are going to see this kind of thing every day. They might see it, be involved in this kind of situation once in their entire career. Um, and so I think it's possible that, you know, the idea that everyone is going to be packing heat and ready to uh, defend themselves could introduce a, more confusion and more chaos. Um, and there's just a simple fact that, you know, these kinds of incidents are, very, are relatively rare, accidental shootings, you know, people reaching for a gun and in the middle of a domestic dispute, that isn't rare. Um, and the general, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the reaction to kind of have more guns around in case this one extraordinary event takes place is horrifying, but but really spectacular attacks take place, you know, it, there, there's, it's more, it's, there's a bigger picture than that. There's a bigger context than that, where you kind of open yourself to all these kinds of, of everyday, uh, you know, misuse or accidents of, with guns um, that, that don't attract, you know, that don't attract the same kind of attention as this. Last question before we go. Uh, how much a year does the NRA spend on, on Congress? Lobbying, uh, you know, it, it, it varies. Uh, it, it really varies. Uh, I don't, I, I don't have the uh, the lobbying figures myself. I, one of my colleagues, Mike Spees, writes a lot more about, um, you know, them, uh, the NRA as political actors. But I do know that uh, in the past election cycle, um, they spent big to elect Donald Trump and to uh, and to back congressional Republicans. Bigger than they've spent more than they've ever than they've ever. Uh, than they've ever spent in the past. You know, um, I think they may have spent about, and Mike will probably correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but, you know, I think they spent something about $30 million um, in independent expenditures backing Trump and probably a similar amount to back congressional candidates. You know, more than almost any other outside group except for, you know, the actual RNC and DNC and their various congressional committees. They spend a lot of money when they think that they're, causes on the line. And there's not an equivalent counterweight uh, on the other side. On that note, <laughs> gives us 
very little hope. Uh, Alexia Blonde, Sorry. thank you very, very much for, for joining us today and kind of unpacking everything as quickly as possible. Um, always great reading your work on thetrace.com. He also... Sorry, the, the, the trace.org. Oh, excuse me, the trace.org because you're a nonprofit. Uh, you have been been great on Twitter explaining you know, what's, what's been going on here and uh, just always a thought-provoking conversation. So thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me.